Thanks for coming along, everyone. I didn't expect this many people, to be honest, about such a dry topic. <laughs> yeah, it is. Run. <laughs> I'll just give everyone a chance to sit down. <clears throat> Come on in. <laughs> All right, we'll get started, guys. Um, let me not take this thing off. So this session is obviously about tests. If you're here for something else, you're in the wrong room. Um, can we have a show of hands who's written tests before, for Drupal specifically? So we've got a good coverage. And what about in, like other testing frameworks like PHP unit and the like? Okay, no worries. All right, so um, just a bit about me first. Um, I've been doing this for about four years now. I work with Previous Next in Sydney, so we work with uh, large enterprises and uh, government agencies. Um, been a fair few of our colleagues presented already. I've got about 35 odd country modules that I maintain in various degrees. Some of them I, I don't really do much with anymore, but I uh, may have been involved in their exception. Um, about around about uh, shortly after Drupal 7.8 came out, I put my hand up to maintain forum. Um, which I might be relieved of shortly because it's uh, on the chopping block to go in Drupal 8. Uh, I've recently joined the Drupal security team and I've got about 60 core commits against my name. And so if you're looking to talk to me about anything, I'm normally in Drupal IRC in the Drupal AU channels uh, or Drupal Contribute. I'm pretty approachable. Um, and so, yeah, if you have any questions after this or next week or whenever, let me know. A couple of things I'm pretty passionate about at the moment. Um, I'm working to decouple the comment module from the node module. So in Drupal 8, you hopefully, if this gets in, you'll be able to comment on any entity. You could even have two comment fields on the one node and have a for and against column, and people could vote in each column. Um, and we're also working on moving blocks to content entities. So you get all of the goodness of a block, like you've got with Bean in Drupal 7, but in core in 8. So I'm plugging both of those because they need reviews. The comment ones need a review since November. And the block one uh, reviews are starting to trickle in. And so if you enjoy the session, uh, take a look at those patches. I can uh, set you up after the session with some issue cues, if you like. But we'll just uh, talk about the goals today. I want to talk about a process uh, taking you from a click monkey to a code monkey. Uh, people kind of familiar with what I'm talking about here uh, and the behaviors. We have a show of hands who would think they're a click monkey and who would think they're a code monkey. There's no, no name and shaming. We're not going to disgrace. Um, but basically, uh, if you're sort of continuously finding yourself clicking things and we want to uh, transition into the phase where you can run tests, let them run, and you know, rest easier that things work the way you, you hope they would. We're going to talk about the why, the when, the what, and the how. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the Drupal.org testing infrastructure. Uh, we'll talk about some core tests, contrib tests, uh, what to do when things go wrong, because they will, and how to debug them. And if we've got time, we'll briefly touch on continuous integration. In fact, there's, uh, that's been covered already, obviously. There's been a few sessions on that. So the click monkey way, um, just to define this clearly so people know, uh, you're pretty much doing everything with the mouse. Um, you're repetitive. You, know, you make a change, and, and you check that it works in your local site. And then you deploy it, and you check that it works in your staging site. And then you deploy it, and you make sure it works in your production site. And you know, it's basically repeating the same thing. and uh, there's a, there's a lot of effort involved, and you know, with developers, we're lazy. We we might try and avoid that effort. So it might work on local, so we push it up, and it might work on staging, so we push it up and go. Well, we're not going to click it again because I know it takes me 45 minutes to click through that, and so we you know we don't do it. And uh, yeah, it, it's not as easy to stop to track when something went wrong. If you have test coverage, um, and you know you push to your repository and you've got continuous integration, or you've got something going. You see that something fails, you know you broke the build, you know what broke it, you know what feature broke it or what bug fix, and you can easily pinpoint it. It makes it easier to find when the regression occurred, which makes it easier to find what the regression was. But, I mean, increasing to the converted here, this is nothing Drupal-centric. This is, you know, pretty much in general for software development. And then the CodeMonkey way, which is where we're going to take on this fantastic journey to, 
Uh, you're going to test everything with automated tests. Uh, you set and forget, basically. Um, you know, you'd be foolish to think just because you've got test coverage, nothing's going to go wrong. You know, there's degrees of test coverage. And um, this is about making, you know, you've, you've still got to make sure that you've got test coverage for the things that matter. And you've still got to make sure that they're actually being run. And, you know, they're pointless if they're not. But as I said, this dovetails nicely with continuous integration and it gives you an opportunity to pinpoint when things stop working. Just for some lightheartedness, this is a great web comic if you're not into geek and poke. Um, but yeah, they have great you know, explanations of technical terms for non-technical people. The Ajax one is particularly good, um, so I recommend checking that out. But uh, what we want to talk about is test-driven development. So basically, for those that aren't familiar, it's you find a bug, you write a test that verifies the bug, and then you write the fix, and then you run the test and verify the bug is gone. You know, sort of that process, um, it adds extra quality to your work and it ensures that, um, you know, as time goes by, that test coverage that we talked about gets uh, more and more enhanced. So a hypothetical example, while we're talking today, we're going to go through a, a hypothetical example of an online classified site. So in an online classified site, your typical behaviour is you know, people can come along, anonymous users, they can create content. Now let's just say it's, a, you know, it's a for sale items or job listings or whatever, and they can't publish that content until they pay. So we've got e-commerce integration. And uh, so we're going to look at the module Commerce Node Checkout. Um, it provides that functionality for the Commerce module. And we're going to be focusing on end-to-end -end, end integration. So um, we're not just testing the functionality of that module, but we're testing the functionality of that module in the context of our particular use case or our particular requirements. Um, so if you've got any questions throughout, feel free to put your hand up and yell out. I um, just went to an excellent session earlier that was conducted along that matter, and uh, yeah, I found it much more useful. So just on that, getting off on the right foot. Now, the test-based method isn't going to work if, uh, if you're making changes on your production environment directly. You know, you've got to be using a code-based methodology. So we're talking about things like features or configuration management. And um, there's some good sessions on it at, the, uh, today, at this event. Um, you just missed the configuration management one. I just went to that in the previous session and it highly recommend it. Check it out online. Um, yeah, it was basically uh, the, the configuration module is the backport of the configuration management type functionality from Drupal 8 to Drupal 7. And uh, it has a lot of similarities to features, but in a large uh, environment, has a lot of advantages over features. And it basically is the um, features is being used for what it wasn't intended for at the moment. It was intended for grouping like functionality, but instead we're using it, uh, sorry, you know, common sets of functionality or a feature. Um, and we find that most people are using it for actually deploying functionality. So check those both out online. Um, but yeah, with a code-based methodology, um, you can reproduce um, the same environment in your test classes as you would have in your live site. So we're talking about, um, you know, you start a project and the first thing you do is you create an install profile. And you don't turn on a module by going and ticket and turning on. You put it in the info install profile as a dependency. Uh, you don't configure things with, uh, by clicking them in the UI. You go through and you make sure that the changes are made with, say, variable set in an update hook or using the configuration module. Um, you know, by, there's a lot of different approaches to doing it, but the, the main goal is that you're using um, a code-based methodology to manage the configuration and uh, structure of your site. And so, yeah, we've got features, you've got the configuration module, uh, you can use API functions and submit handlers in um, update hooks, and that's where the configuring Update update functions and staying sane session. Uh, we'll talk about that more. And look, even in the worst case scenario, you, you might have to do database queries to make changes, but you know, making sure everything goes through a code-based methodology um, is kind of the first step to getting reproducible test environment. So can I just show of hands how many people already know this and I'm just preaching to the converted? Like who here is not using a code base or who here is using a code-based methodology? Um, I think you need a solid version control, and again, I'm probably preaching to the converted here as well, but something like Gitflow where, you know, you branch off, you work on a feature or a bug in a separate branch in isolation and uh, merge it back in when it's ready. And, you know, the tests should be, as they are in core, a gate 
before that feature is considered ready to merge. You know, if it doesn't come with tests or what should it be testing? Um, so it also, what you know, I was saying earlier about you can pinpoint when things went wrong. I mean, if you're not using version control, you, you really can't. Um, so yeah, we're, what we're basically looking at our, uh, when you have to make your first decision, you've built this classified site, you've got your uh, commerce no checkout installed, and I've got a, like an example site here, uh, which is the product of an install profile. And uh, so we'll be working on this install profile called Sell Your Stuff, which basically provides all the functionality that we talked about here. This is up on GitHub and there's slides at the end. Um, but when you install this profile, you get a content type, you get a product, um, standard listing, which is your uh, pay to publish content uh, pub, uh, product, and it's already associated with a particular content type. And uh, so this is what you end up with when you install the install profile. And so we can use this as the basis for our tests to ensure that we're in the same reproducible environment every time. So back to the presentation. This is where you've got to make your first decision. You've built the site, you're ready to go. I mean, the first thing you want to check is that the, the checkout process works. You know, your client has paid you to build this site. This is their revenue stream. They want to be sure that you, know, you update commerce or another contributor module on your site, that your checkout process isn't going to break and they're going to call you in the middle of the night and say, what's going on? So this is where you make the decision, manual tests or automated tests. And I'm sure most people out in the room here would know what that number is for. <laughs> yeah? Um, if you're testing your checkout process by typing that number in, you, you know what I'm talking about. And this is when you, you know, should maybe be looking at, at moving to this uh, automated testing. Um, there's other things people might be using, macro plugins for Firefox or Chrome where they record your clicks and you can run them. Um, form auto-completes, uh, you know. Look, before I used to work this way, I know for a fact I could go to any commerce checkout form on any site and start typing and it'll recognise the fields and it'll provide me with 4111. <laughs> um, so yeah, w w this is where you've got to make the decision and, and weigh up the costs involved with both. So when you want to test, well budget is a, is a factor, but you also have to weigh in maintenance cost. Um, there's a cost associated with, with doing that manual testing and there's also a cost associated with uh, when things go wrong and if you're after you know responsible for the maintenance of the site and you've constantly got regressions or bugs that you should have test coverage for well there's a cost involved in that as well and that cost I would say would offset the time it takes to write the tests and do it you know, properly from the start and there's other things that you've got to weigh up here you've got click fatigue I mean you, know, you don't want an RSI injury from going through the checkout process um, and, you know, you need to decide which things that you want to test and you want to, um, based on their importance. You know, so I talked about here the checkout process. That's obviously the critical functionality of this site. You don't need to test that, you know, people can log in. You don't need to test all those things. That's kind of the Drupal. Um, you're really interested in the end-to-end -end integration that's specific to your business case here. And what it does help you do is, is keep a lid or uh, limit the, the your risk to regressions and it... Uh, obviously provides you with an extra <coughs> string in your bow for quality when you're selling to the client that, you know, hey, we practice uh, test-driven development, you know, we back up our, our work with tests and we can, you know, it, it gives you that extra bit of uh, prestige in what you do. And so what do you want to test? Well, the general rule, you've got to test critical functionality. Um, we talked about that. But you know, new tests for new features. You branch off your Git flow model and you create you know, you've got a user story which is a certain set of functionality and you've got tests to go with that. And if you've got peer review, uh, certainly the previous next, that's one of the gates before, during peer review is, is there a test or should there be a test? Um, why isn't there a test? Show me a test, you know. And yeah, when a, when a bug is identified, as I said before, write the test, verify it, fix the bug, run the test. And, you know, hopefully you should never have to think about that bug again. If you've got continuous integration, you know straight away if someone's broken it. So, how do you get started? Well, you probably do have to do one manual test run because you need to work through logically in your mind the steps that you're testing for your end-to-end. -end. Um, so in our example, you would work through the checkout process and you'd have a pen beside you or you'd have your code editor open 
And as you click, you do the equivalent in your test class. As you submit a form, you do the equivalent. And so we'll go through that in detail shortly, but um, when you see them side by side, it kind of makes, it makes sense. It's, it's, not that, uh, it's not that hard to grasp. Um, but we'll get the basics ready first. So the first thing you've got to do is um, extend the base classes with your new class. And so this is rocket science, people familiar with it. Um, in Drupal 7, you've got to register your class with the, with the uh, registry. So is everyone familiar how you do that in Drupal 7? Basically, you've got to declare the file in your info file of your module. And so with the files array, and your file has to end in .test, and um, clear your cache, and you're good to go. So Drupal 7, we would ordinarily extend the Drupal web test case. You create your test file. Uh, suffix it with a dot .test extension. Uh, you need to declare to Drupal what your test does, and so your class needs to implement the get info method. And the get info method is like an info hook, and, and most people who write Drupal modules or have written Drupal modules would be familiar with an info hook. It basically tells Drupal the name of your module, what group it belongs to, and what it does. Uh, and then you set up your tests with a setup method. So every method in your test class that is prefixed with test, so test widgets, test foobar, that's considered an individual test by Drupal. And when the tests run, it runs each of those instances. But before that, it runs the setup method. And so in your test class, you can use the setup method to get the environment the way you want it for that particular test. Now, in most cases, you'd, that would include logging a user in because you know, most of the functionality you provide in Drupal is for an authenticated user. And so, one thing you're always going to do in, is re, up, um, install the required modules, right? Your, your, t your module might define um, in its info file its dependencies, but in the case of, say, an install profile, you might need other things that are specific to that test. You, so, yeah, you've got, to, you've got to take care of the housekeeping. And I've seen places where the dependency chain doesn't work flawlessly. Um, so just be mindful of that. If something doesn't work the way you thought it would, just you know, make sure you've got all the... Uh, all the modules that you need. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, how to debug what's going wrong shortly. So Drupal 8, and this is especially important for people who want to get involved in core or who are coming to the core sprint, um, you need to extend Drupal simple test web test based. Now, this is PSR zero namespacing, and if you've been to any of the sessions on, say, Symfony or web services, you've seen that before. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail. But there's some um, differences between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. In Drupal 7, you have to set up, uh, you have to call parent setup in your setup method and pass the array of modules you need enabled. And I'll show the example of that shortly. But in Drupal 8, it's a static property on your class, which is an array, and it's just an array of the module machine names. And uh, that's certainly much simpler. And in Drupal 8, we also have a testing profile, which is a stripped down install profile. If you're writing tests for core, um, you should be considering using the testing profile uh, other than, say, standard or minimal. Um, you know, if you're testing the functionality of a particular module and you don't need node installed, you don't need comment, you don't need the two content types and the search block placed in the left-hand sidebar and the powered by Drupal in the, you know, use the testing profile because every one of those test methods in your class is a complete Drupal install. What it will do is it will spin up a whole new install of your site in a prefixed database class, so it creates a new connection, and it um, uses prefix tables, which people were probably familiar with. It was the big whiz-bang thing in earlier versions of Drupal. Um, so if you can minimize what that has to do on install every time, um, your tests are going to be a hell of a lot faster. And so obviously for core, where tests are taking close to an hour at the moment, yeah, the test suite for core is taking close to an hour to run. We have uh, an enormous amount of tests. Yeah, if possible, use the testing profile. And if you're doing you know, simple tests of your module functionality, when you get to Drupal 8, it's available there for you to use. Um, and I've got some code examples of Drupal 8, which I'd like to show you now um, to see the main differences. And so, uh, first of all, your, your namespace, which is PSR 0, use the web test space. And this is a tracker test from Core. And we're enabling the comment module, the tracker module, and the history module. Um, and they're the tests that are needed for this test, uh, modules that are required for this test. 
Um, we have a protected variable to keep the user. We have another user. So this is the get info. And this is the same as it is in Drupal uh, 7. You return an array. The name of the test, the description, and what group it belongs to. And the group is a, is a powerful feature. If you're writing tests for your, for your project, for your uh, requirements, if you use a particular group, that's helpful for you to run them in a targeted environment with, say, Drush and with continuous integration. You don't need to run the full suite of core tests against your project. You just need to run the ones that are particular to your project. So when we get to shortly how you actually run the tests, um, I'll show you where that is useful because, yeah, it means you can pinpoint exactly the tests that you want in a, in a, in a nice chunk. And so we'll just have a quick look through the setup method on this Drupal 8 one. Um, sets up the parent because it's inheriting and sets up a few things for this test. So this test requires a content type, type page. Um, it requires a user with access comments, create page content, post comments and some other stuff off the side. Um, and it creates it, it needs two of those users and it, and it needs some variable set. So that setup method runs for every test that are in this class and then so Here's one test, here's another test, and each one of these runs in a separate install. So, yeah, you can see where um, getting this commonality between the three could easily go into the setup method so you're not repeating yourself. Uh, and I've just put a line in there. Okay, so back to our checkout processing. Um, we would follow through the logical manner. So the first thing we'll do is we would log as an anonymous user. We would navigate to the add content page. We would fill in the form. We would hit submit. We would verify that we were redirected to the checkout page. We would fill out our address details. We would hit continue to the next step. We would put in our credit card details and we would complete payment. And then we might log in as the admin user and make sure that the node that they created was published. And we'd go to the order section and make sure that the, the order came through and the price was right. Is this, you know, kind of follows through logical? Yeah, it's pretty, yep. So what you do in the browser, basically, um, and <coughs> what does that look like in code? Sorry, I've lost my mouse. Can anyone see it on that card? Hey, here we are. So this is the test for the, uh, the sell your stuff module, um, install profile. In our setup, um, we're also requiring commerce order UI. Uh, I'll get to why in a minute, but we don't want the order UI on our production site for this particular install profile, so we can actually enable additional modules that aren't in the install profile, but we need it for the purpose of tests. Um, we're going to create a user for the different operations that we need. So, uh, not a good choice of background color. Here we go. Um, so, admin permissions. We want to be able to access the content overview. We want to administer nodes. We want to view some commerce orders. And we want to administer the orders. And so, we create an, an admin user against the test by going this Drupal create user and passing in the permission. Um, and so we want to, what we're basically doing is, we've only got one test in this class, but, you know, as I worked through them sequentially before, is this, everyone can read this, it's not too small. Cool. Sorry, guys. So, we're not logged in. First thing we do is we go to node 8 page. So we use Drupal get and it performs a get request with simple tests internal uh, browser and goes to node add page. And if you run these in the UI, you actually get the HTML for node add page. And so you can see if there's any warnings, what went wrong, is, was it what you expected to see? I'll get to that shortly. Um, and so the first thing we want to make sure in our test is that anonymous users can actually get to that page because ordinarily they wouldn't be able to, right? Um, that's you know, create content is normally protected permission. And, and so if our install profile is doing what it should, the anonymous user should get a 200 there. They should get a valid response, not a 403, not a 404. So we assert that the response was a 200. And then we want to create a, a listing. So we're going to sell a lovely three-year-old miniature pony here named Rainbow Sparkles. 
And so we've got a title and we've got a body. Now those people who've worked with the form API will probably recognise the format of this. Um, and those people who've worked with entities in Drupal 7 will probably know and love language none uh, or, or hate. Um, and if you went to mo uh, most of the session on web services on uh, yesterday, first session, and he talked about entity next generation, um, if you hate language none and you hate this zero value, you're going to love entity next generation because you go node, title, value, and you get the value. You go node, body, value, and you get the value. And if, it's an, if your language content is Italian, you go node, body, value, and you get the Italian version. It, it's, for a developer experience, it's... it's <laughs> you know, bellissimo, you know? <laughs> so basically, say you don't know the form API, or you don't know the structure of the node, and you want to find out what am I, what, do I, what is this edit thing supposed to look like? What is this voodoo? Um, uh, oh, we're back. Um, you can actually look at the markup. So I'll set up a anonymous user. In a, I'm in a private browsing window here, so I know I'm anonymous. Uh, node add particle. <laughs> What the? <coughs> Add content? Basic page, here we go. Um, so I'm going <coughs> to create my miniature pony, right? Uh, miniature pony. Uh, I really should watch my uh, autocorrect. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> um, what, <laughs> what happens with children. And we were demonstrating a, like a screencast to a client once. and. Um, yeah, something came up that was really not right. But yeah, if you've got young children and they're sitting there, you say, what should I use here? And they just spit out the randomest things, yeah. Okay, so how do we know what, what we're supposed to be submitting there? If you inspect the elements that you're submitting and you look at the name attribute in the DOM, that's what you're submitting. That's what your post variables need to be keyed by. So body, und, which you would know is language done, zero value. Incidentally, in Drupal 8, it's now language not specified, um, just because we know you like these things. Change, yeah, yeah. No, it's actually to standardise with uh, everything. Like, there's actually a standard for nominating that. Um, so we want to post that form. So the arguments to the post are where you want to post it to, what you want to post, and what button you want to click. Because, as you saw on the no form back there, there's a couple of buttons, save and preview, so you need to actually pass those in. And you'll notice I've wrapped them in T, um, and that's just you know, good practice because that button could be translated if you were working in a multilingual environment. But the null, the reason we're passing null is because we already navigated to node add page earlier, back up here at line 54. So we don't need to navigate there again, and Drupal's internal browser in simple test is smart enough to know that. And so we want to check that things work. So if I that example. See these notices here. Basic page, miniature has been created and stat enlisted into your cart. So if you were doing this manually, that would be the first thing you'd check, that it, that it kind of worked the way you were expecting. So we just go looking for those. Come on, mouse. I need to make a bigger pointer. There it is. Uh, we're checking for a basic page miniature pony has been created and the standing listing was added to your cart. Now, because I'm actually hard coding the miniature pony up here, it's safe for me to do that. But if I was using um, you know, a variable or something, I would probably use something like a format string to make sure that you had the um, string uh, injected the same way that Drupal was doing it, um, replicating what was actually happening in the module so that you get the same, um, it, it's going through the same pipeline basically and you get the reproducible result. But what I'm doing is here, this is going to be like, can you see it? Where's Wally? There it is. Um, assert text is checking for text on the page. Now, there's a lot of other methods which we'll get to shortly, but assert text is if you're checking for text. And assert raw is another one you can use that will check for markup because assert text uh, has been passed through plain text. Uh, check plain, which everybody knows. Hands up. Yeah, everyone know what check plain is? Basically, it sanitizes. Uh, it's just a wrapper around HTML special chars. So we're checking for both those. That's all good. How are we going for time? I'm going to speed things up a bit. Um, 
And then we just uh, verified that our URL is of the format checkout um, with, a, with a number after. I'm not going to go into detail what PregMatch does because we'd be here all day. But basically our format goes to checkout too. And so that's what we're, we're interested in. We're making sure that we've gone to the right URL. So we can get the URL that, that the browser's on from this get URL. And if we've got two matches like you would with PregMatch, we've been redirected. Um, if we wanted to get tricky, we could assert that there was a 301 redirect there. Um, so, you probably rightly point out this might be a little bit fragile, but I'm assuming that the first node that's created is node one. But because this is a fresh install, I mean, this is from this point on, it's installed a brand, brand new site. So the first node is going to be node one. And so it's, it's relatively um, safe to do that. There's a lot of things in core that would, um, you know, say you submit a node, it would match on the, on the path, same as we got the uh, order ID in this preg stuff. But yeah, it, in this case, it's safe. And we want to make sure that the node is not published because the intent of this site is someone goes in, they can create a node, but no one else can see it until they actually fork the cache out. So that's what we get up to here. And now, here we start to submit the checkout form. Now, we inspect the checkout form like we did before, and we look at our elements, and we get the names of them. And you know, some big ones there. And we make sure we've got the same thing in our submitted values. But basically, that line 80 down to line 92 is one step of the checkout process. And you want to know how fast simple tests can do that compared to you filling out by hand? Um, yeah, a lot faster. So yeah, everyone familiar with Drupal Commerce, it's a two-step process by default. And both the buttons say continue to the next step, even though the last one actually submits the form. So the first step, put the address. Second step, payment. Third step, submit it. Um, and I've commented the code here because this is available on GitHub and yeah, this is actually complete payment, right? It just, it, it seems weird. And so the first, we check the check, we assert that the thing is complete. Now this is going to really, I'm not going to actually go through that because we're short on time, but believe me, um, when you commit that, when you submit that, that's what you get, um, check out complete. So we go looking for that and make sure it's there. And we use format string here to pass in the uh, commerce order number, which we got earlier up here, and the reason we do that is, as I said before, that's what commerce is doing internally. And If we just ch ch checked for your order number is number, um, you might get uh, inconsistent results. So where possible, use format string. And that's identical in arguments to the T function, uh, which is most people would be familiar with. Um, so now we want to just do the admin side of things. We log in as admin, we go to admin content node, and we make sure that miniature pony is on that site. And we make sure this published. Now, this is probably, you know, if I was being honest, it's a little bit fragile to look for the word published on that page. But because the site's just been freshly installed and it's only got one node, if it wasn't published, you know, you, you wouldn't see it. Um, so, yeah, we load the node back up. And we use the true argument here at the end to make sure that we don't get one from the static cache. And we assert, assert that the node is published now. And then just for some extra, you know, make sure the price was right. We go to the commerce order page and we make sure that we get a 200 there. And it's worth pointing out that if you use Drupal get to navigate to admin commerce orders for um, a slash view, if that order didn't exist, you won't get a fail. Because it, that might be what you're trying to test. You might be trying to test that that's an invalid URL. So you have to actually assert that it's a 200 to make sure that that page actually exists. You would get a fail because the text you're looking for later on doesn't there, isn't there, but yeah. Um, if the, the URL that you navigate to with the internal browser doesn't exist or is access denied, um, it won't, the Drupal get won't throw a fail because that might be what you were expecting to happen. And we just check for, oops, find and replace fail there. <laughs> uh, ooh, and coding standards fail, no? No. Yeah. Sorry. We did, I did a run through this presentation and uh, someone rightly pointed out that I shouldn't be using UND, I should be, so sorry. Uh, I'll push that up after. So yeah, that's kind of working through it sequentially. Um, I'm going to get a bit of a wiggle on here.
So we, we looked at some of these before. Um, you can check for raw output with the cert raw, and you can check for plain text with, with the cert text. Um, I said, you should check for specific markup that you're expecting, but you need to be aware that you're not picking something that's going to change from time to time. So if you're looking for a piece of markup that goes through a theme template and, you know, Joe blogs the themer, goes and changes the markup because he wants to use some diff you know, something different, um, you know, your tests might fail. And it's not a failure in its true sense of that something's broken, but it's a, it's a failure that, you know, so he's going to have to go in and modify the test. So if you can pick something that's specific but not too specific, um, yeah. There's a couple of the utility methods, this fail and this pass, and they're kind of things that you would use in your logic flow. So say, for example, you've got a try catch block and you're expecting it to throw an error and you end up in the catch block, you would this pass. But if you didn't throw an error, um, well, and it was supposed to, you would this fail. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing you're actually asserting for. It's just in your logic, in your code, you, you're finding places where you're expecting particular behavior. And there's a great, huge number of um, assert helpers. So you've got things like assert field by ID. And so that will make sure that there's a field on the page by passing it the ID. There's a cert field by name. There's a cert option is checked. There's, you know, there's a myriad of uh, assert helpers that I'm not going to go into here. But if you're interested and you, you know, you're going to do this sort of thing, um, look at the base class and read the code. And that's always, with anything, the best way to learn it. Um, and there's one other powerful feature, which is XPath. Hands up, who's familiar with XPath? Yeah, OK. It's basically an XML parsing <coughs> language. It's kind of like jQuery, but kind of not. Um, yeah, if you Google XPath syntax, um, and I think you can even ask the IRC bot, you'll get a link to it. Um, yeah, it's, it helps you with the kind of thing I was talking about before, with specific markup that you're searching for. But it's not, um, it's not that uh, intuitive how it works, um, if you're not familiar with it. And oh, I'll look, I'll, I find it painful. <laughs> So there's a lot of other helper functions. You saw before in, in the tracker test, there was Drupal create content type. So yes, you could create an edit array. You could log a user in as someone with administer content types. You could go to add content type. You could submit the form. But why do that when you can use Drupal create no type or Drupal create no, Drupal create user? There's a lot of these. There's cron run. There's click link. Um, and Drupal get no by title, title is probably the method I should have used in that test where I was, instead of going node load one, could have just noted load. Uh, loaded the node back that uh, was titled Miniature Pony. OK, so we said before testing all of core is slow. <laughs> there must be a loose cable over here. How do you actually run the tests? Um, look, I would, I would advocate that test, testing the automated test is far quicker than doing it uh, manually. But it kind of depends on what you're doing in your test. And if you have got stuff in your test where um, you're for example, uh, got features involved and there's features rebuilds, that can add a fair bit of time to the test because um, as soon as the install occurs with each of your test methods, a cron run fires and a cron run fires a features rebuild and the features rebuild can take quite a while. So yeah, be, be mindful of that. And if you've got things in cron that go off and fetch web services or you know, update module, you need to be careful because you know, that's run at the very start of every test and if you can trim those down, yeah, do so. So to test it, you need to enable the simple test module. And this comes in core in Drupal 7. In Drupal 6, it was a contrib module. Uh, I'm just making sure it's turned on. Yeah. It's there. If you might not have seen it before. Um, and then you head up to your configuration tab. And you've got a testing tab. And here's all the core tests. And there's quite a lot of them. And here's our tests. And they, they show up in the groups that we showed before. And so you can click through the device to do this. Or you can also use drush. And the command is drush test dash run. And you have to pass the minus l argument. Or you need to have that in your drush rc. So it knows what the actual URL of the site is. Um, because it is performing uh, with a simple test browser navigating to and from sites. It needs to know. But if you've got your tests grouped, you can just say drush, test dash run, minus l, example.com, say your stuff. And it'll run all the tests in that suite. And so um, there's a minus minus XML flag, so you can integrate with uh, 
you know, continuous integration with these test results. But yeah, basically click it, run it, and let it go. And um, like we want to have a get, how long you think it would take you to do it manually? Probably a minute, two minutes, three minutes. Um, it, it comes back pretty quick for, for a small set of functionality. And we're testing from end to end here. Uh, if you were doing it manually, you would probably, oh, well, I don't need to do that step. Oh, I'm skipping that step. And so, yeah, um, it's going to prove me wrong. Yeah, if you're doing 50 tests especially, yeah. But if you're doing 50 tests, it'll take longer. And as I said, if you've got features, it'll take even longer again. Um, and so I'll let that run and I'll come back. Uh, these are some special cases that I think are worth note. Most sites these days would have image integration and getting those isn't obviously straightforward. You know, you would click on the browse button on a form upload and you would attach an image and you would hit submit and you know, the image gets sent from your computer. But you can use that chunk of code there. Um, the simple test space class has a, a swag of test images and other files you can access. And if anyone's used the Val Generator, it's just that same little square image with the circles in it. Um, and yeah, you, what you do is you get the image, the code at the top, and then you use Drupal real path and you put that in your post variables and you send that through. And the uh, media module uses an FID, so you, can, you have to actually save that image first to get an FID. Um, so yeah, you, you pass that to file save, the actual image, and uh, you get an FID back. I just thought those were worth a special mention. And things go wrong, um, and look, the debug function is your friend. Things like if you don't have access to a, a debugger, as in, you know, look, you're running on a virtual machine or you haven't got it set up, um, the debug will let you output things through your code. Um, you can't use things like DSM or DPR or KPR or all the different flavors of Crumo because, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's not available in that environment. So debug is the go. Um, and look, people will probably gasp at the third line, but don't be afraid to go in. If you're getting some random error about some module that's, or some permission that's supposed to be there and it's not found, go into the line and code in core that's causing that warning and put some code in there. Look, you've got your site under version control. You're just going to check that back out anyway. You're not really hacking it. You're just learning about it, you know? <laughs> uh, and Watchdog isn't available because um, it's every site spins up its own database. And so Watchdog uh, is writing to this new database every time. Um, we've got a Drush plugin called Watchdog Simple Test that you can get and put it in your Drush.Drush .drush folder and it gives you all of your Drush Watchdog commands just add an extra S to the end. So Drush Watchdog Show, Drush, like it's Drush WS. Drush WSS will um, look up the prefix that Simple Test is using and get you the uh, values from that actual install. Now you need to make sure that DB Log is a required module in your tests so that stuff's actually going into the DB Log table. But uh, it is handy, particularly with features. And if you're wondering why something's taking so long, Drush WSS. Minus minus tail, which works like tail does in um, the command line, and minus minus full, so you get the full output, and you'll just see what it's actually doing. So if you're sitting scratching your head, going, "What? Well, it's not doing anything," you know, go in and use that, and you can see rebuilding feature, rebuilding feature. Re <laughs> okay, unit tests. We haven't really talked about them much, but a unit test is like when X comes in, Y goes out, and so there's unit tests in core for things like. Uh, image style effects, you know, like if I pass in an image of size 150 by 200 and I've got an effect that's got a resize that's a 90 by 90, I should get an image out the other side. And these are things where you don't need the internal browser of simple test, uh, the, of the web test that you can navigate to pages and things. It's just testing the functionality. Um, but there's no database, there's no files, you can't enable modules, you can't use watchdog, module implements, any of the hooks. There's no database, you know. Um, but these are way faster. And so if there is functionality that is atomic, that is utility, uh, use it wherever possible. But you need to take care of loading files and modules that you need. And um, yeah, you can fake enable modules. And um, thanks to whoever, I can't recall where I got this from, but basically it's just uh, hijacking the module list module to uh, function to fake enable a module. and. Um, there's a limited set of assert methods as well. There's no assert field by ID because there's nothing to assert it against. 
Drupal 8 has a new class called Unit Tests Remastered. And if you're interested, check out that, that node. But it adds a new um, class called Drupal Unit Test Base. And it is like a mock implementation of a lot of the Drupal functionality. So there's mock hooks, um, you know, mock module installation. Um, you know, a lot of them are sort of pure, um, empty implementations. That, um, that, uh, it's, so it's obviously much faster than the web test space. And so if you need some of the Drupalisms that, you would, that your module is going to operate in, but you don't need uh, to navigate anywhere with Drupal get and Drupal post, you should use the um, unit test remastered. So I want to talk a little bit about, what have we got, 45 minutes here? I might skip over this. If, if you maintain a contributor module, you can enable this um, for contributor modules so that you have automated testing of your branches. Um, if you want to talk to me about that, come and see me after. But you can also do the same thing in your issue queues so that when people put up a patch, they can see straight away if it doesn't pass. Um, I have another 15, do I? Score. <laughs> Hang on, let's see if I can go back. Yeah, so basically if you head to your module and you go to the version control tab, uh, sorry, the automated testing tab, you can see the results. Now this is an empty module, there's no tests, zero passes, right? But uh, it's there for you to, to use. Uh, you can also head to the issues tab under the edit tab and hit enable automated testing and so Anytime anyone uploads a patch to your module and they choose needs review, uh, the test bot will go off and, and test that. And it, you know, it saves you know, people's uploads. Something won't apply anymore. It's, it's got a fatal in it. And you know, it saves, you know, if it doesn't pass the test, then you, know, you can probably delay looking at it a little bit longer. OK, and this is the plug for tomorrow, to getting started with core tests. Um, like, Who's uploaded a patch before to Drupal.org that fixed a bug, but you know it's been told, well, it needs tests before it goes in? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I've been in that situation before. My first core patch was just before 7.0 came out that fixed a problem with the theme pre-processing, like the theme suggestions weren't working. And I went right through core, and I found this issue. And I thought, oh, great, I've solved something. I put it up. and got enough back, needs tests. And so that was my first exposure to writing tests for core. And to be honest, um, as with anything in Drupal, the more you read, you know, the more you learn. You, you see example code and you dig into it and, it, and it, you know, it, that's where the light bulbs go on. So um, if you want to get started, check out the needs tests tag. And there is a tag specifically for issues that are fixed, but they need a test. And if you write a test for it, you know, upload two versions of the patch, one with the test, call it dot fail, dot patch, and one with the, with the test and a fix, call it dot pass, dot patch. And upload them in that issue, put, the, put, um, put them in that order. Put the fail one in first, put the pass one in next. The test bot will test both of them. The first one will come back red, because your new test verifies the bug. And the second one will come back green, because the test plus the fix, it's sorted. Um, find the needs work issue. There's a lot of people who've put a lot of time into patches, and they get towards the end, and you know, there's just one little test that they can't get to pass. And I'm sure those people would love someone who wants to get started to come in and just find what is causing it, you know, and spend the time debugging it. And, come on, and you come along and you'll be the hero. You'll, the people will love you. So come along to the Sprint Day on Saturday if you like this kind of stuff. Um, and there's, yeah, a specific task that the core mentoring process has called needs tests and uh, the people involved Jess and uh, Andrea and Kim, they actually go through and you know, create these tasks for people who want to learn core, who want to write tests, and you know, they can get you started straight away. Uh, the next level um, is continuous integration. And sorry, Mick, I didn't clear your name, but um, yeah, what, what we do at Previous Next, we've started, with, thanks to Nick, uh, Nick down the front here and Mig up the back there, is uh, when we push to the master branch, um, Jenkins um, fires up uh, a test run against a separate install we have specifically for testing, runs the test suite and comes back green if it passes uh, all good, comes back red, everyone gets an email, you broke it, you know, and then Kim rings us up and says, fix it. <laughs> and yeah, look, um, there's various ways to do that, but Drush test run is great. And so if, look, I don't pretend to know anything about this. If you do want to know more, 
Uh, Boris had a session yesterday about it, and uh, Kim, Mick, uh, Nick, and uh, Mig will be able to provide some more information. And, uh, so yeah, um, that's it for that. I'll just go back to the test results. Can anyone see it? I think the problem is the um, the screen resolution doesn't fit out of the projector. Yeah, so you can actually go outside the visible area. There it is. Uh, test results. It's green. And um, if you work in an office with people who run these tests, you will next guy laughing down the front. It's green. You know, um, it's kind of like that. <laughs> and so. This is what you get, right? These are all of our tests. We enabled the modules, we created the permissions, we created a user. And what did that look like? Well, you can actually click on it and it'll show you, it's got, and this isn't just a static page, this is the actual marker. And so if you're expecting a particular thing, uh, oh, overlay, you bastard. I'm going to have to run them again. That's section Drupal 8 out of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it section intensive or just section? <laughs> 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 the hell is it? There it is. JavaScript is attached to the Yes, and that's, a, so there is actually a tag for core issues called needs manual tests, and that's the JavaScript ones. And uh, yeah, I'll come back when that's finished. I'm really annoyed with that because um, so some more information, that whole install profile and all those tests you can get on GitHub. I've still got to push up those fixes that I just made then. The stuff that's up there now works. Okay, well I'll fix that out. Thanks, mate. I'm going to run a boff after this session um, if people want to talk about this in more detail, but also with the focus on core. Um, and if you need help getting your stuff set up for tomorrow and you want to sort of hit the ground running, I'm happy to help. Um, and just up the back, did a similar presentation um, at the Midwest Developer Summit about this. Hers is purely focused on core, and it is a core. Okay, yeah, and um, it's actually a lot more detailed than mine. And I didn't see it till the end, so I didn't plagiarise any of it. I promise. <laughs> uh, so, hey, that was quick. Forty-two seconds. That's the answer to that question. How long would it take you to do manually? I'd say a lot more. Um, if I was in RC, I could ask our bot. We have a bot, and he will answer that question. <laughs> uh, so, for example, you can click on verbose message, and without overlay, it opens in a new tab. And uh, you can actually see up the top uh, a get request to that, and that's where we ended up, and this is what the markup looked like. And as I said, this is the full markup. Um, you can previously index through it, and you can see what was submitted. So there's the, uh, the password for user, better figure her, and um, yeah, there's a checkout complete. You can see the credit card number that we talked about before, and yeah, that's kind of it. Is uh, <coughs> any questions? Hi. Yeah, this is, yeah, I'll just repeat the question. Um, the question was, what happens if you need to run tests in the context of a particular site with live content and users? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, it, is, it is a difficult question. You'll, you noticed in the, um, in the test that we did before, we, we created the node. You know, we, we actually went to the provisioning, I guess, the environment with the content that we need. There is um, other approaches, and I haven't really talked on them here. There's is it Oopal, is that what it's called? The, yeah, there's a, there's a um, work that I think it was most thing we're going to call it Oopal, which is, I think, in the context of that. There is upgrade tests in core which actually use a dump script to dump a database, and the first step is to install that database, but I'm not sure how um, wise it would be to use that. Um, because it's, it's, you've got a, you know, a tar, pardon me. You've got to have a tar uh, gzip of 
the database dump that can be loaded by the test before the tests even start, you know. And so if possible, um, you should try to, I mean, when you test something locally in your local environment, you would only create the node that you would test with. You know, everyone's got a, a Laura Mibson generator, you know, and you're actually generating dummy users and, and, and dummy content in general, yeah? Sure, yeah, yeah? Yeah, so it's kind of that sort of stuff you have to do in your test before, you know, in your setup method or, or in similar. But Yeah, you, you're saying you want to test that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could you could do that because um, yeah, you you just have to create a dummy user first and then you know submit the form values and, and make sure you ended up where you where you expected. And actually, if if you saw in that, that's actually what it does with that this Drupal login. Uh, sorry, I didn't talk about this Drupal login. It was in the code, but this Drupal login is actually just a utility method that actually does what you just said. It goes and logs the person in, and if you have a look in these uh, where I logged in. as the admin user, it actually goes a and does that. So if that was in the context of your install profile that enabled some particular module that did a redirect after login, you wouldn't end up at uh, say stuff user two, you know what I mean? You would actually end up where you're supposed to end up and you could assert that you got the 301 and that the message that you expect in there. So, but yeah, it is, it is a, 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 like a question, particularly in the context of uh, nodes and stuff. Sorry, just behind you. So just to repeat the answer for the tape, um, Jess was saying then that um, if you're looking for that sort of thing, you probably want to look at something else. This is more kind of a, um, a unit, it's, it's not unit testing, but for a better sense of a word, like um, testing the workflow of in, a, in a fixed environment. Is that kind of paraphrasing? Yep, sorry. Yeah, uh, look, I've been plugging it all through lunch. I was v very happy with that session on uh, Yeah. And uh, the question is, I found on Hackaway to get a screenshot and then put it in the test if there's a error. But since it's Hackaway, I don't know if there is any a good way to do that. The, if there's an error, if it'll. There's an error, uh, and then when you see the, the test result, you see like zoom, 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 and then after that, red, then there's an error, and there's a screenshot of the error. Have we got much time left? No? Two minutes. Well, uh, if you want to talk to me after, but if we mock that test so it failed, say we check for $29 or something, um, you still get one of these, even if it fails. You still get this. And, you know, if, if there's an exception or a warning, it'll fail, and you'll see the Drupal set message of, you know, undefined indexed foo in line 74 of, you know, some file. Like, if an error occurs in the test for a PHP warning exception, a fatal error, it'll fail. And the green, 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 um, that we had before will actually be green, red, green, red, green, you know? And you'll have a big red line and it'll say, you know, raw your ordered number, one found, and it'll be in red and you'll be able to check on that verbose message and, and see what it runs. So it actually, I think it's better than a screenshot. But, yeah. I mean, one thing this doesn't test is the visual aspects and that's often a large part of what we do, you know? Making sure that the buttons line up and that, you know, the JavaScript does what it does. So, yeah, it, this isn't the answer for everything, but, yeah. Hey, Ari, hang on. Yeah, sure. Um, I listened to the session on like the screenshot frequency. Which is interesting. Yep. It's great. It's very trivial. We've, I'll talk to you later, but yeah. yeah. We've, there is this in that stuff that we guys did, we did yeah. together, like the end to end testing of all that functionality. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I haven't yeah. seen that. No. So it's great. Um, but um, I um, got experience with Boolean. Yep. 
Which is more of a JavaScript. So like you're waiting for the DOM to load. So the question yeah, was, with Selenium, it. you have to wait. Yep. Yeah, and the reason, see, this is what, like, what I see there without using Wait. It works fine on your, um, on your dev box, which is very fast. Yeah. But then you find that when you're on a slow server and you click on stage or whatever, it just suddenly you're getting these errors. You're getting fails and it's a timing issue. So you've got to add all these weights. Um, I'm just wondering if Victor Tech um, has those, um, those particular API calls. Um, it's based on curl, correct me if I'm wrong. It's using curl. Yeah. So it's actually doing a performing a request. And that's what I was saying before, if you run it through Drush, you've got to have, you know, you've got to pass it the URL that you're testing against. And um, Nick down the front will attest that, you know, if you've got HT auth running, you know, you've got to configure it. There is actually a settings tab. Uh, have you ever had the, the timeout issue? No, no. If you're getting a timeout issue, it'll be a, a timeout PHP max execution time timeout issue. Um, yeah, you can you can pass HT authentication stuff there. Um, you know, if your if your server is behind HT authentication, this simple test is outside using curl to make the requests. And so if it can't, yeah, I mean this simple test is a Drupalism. It's you know we kind of we we, we still maintain a lot of this now, don't we? Oh, I mean all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the entire part of testing our part that the people have right now before is part of Drupal. And um, if we're talking about using um, some other yeah, like, solutions that exist in the open source world, but that's a problem that I'm having. Yeah, I mean, there's, what, more than 25,000 tests? There, there, there's two, I think there's 2,000 plus methods that are out there now, and we have over 50,000 solutions. There you go. So, so if there are better solutions, um, and what they said then is that uh, we, we're currently maintaining this just for Drupal, um, but to move to something else is a big undertaking. There's 2,500 test methods and 50,000 asserts. So, yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a huge task. All right? 